So I'm here in Santa Fe, the sunny sky, and there's a little festival happening out there, all these little white tents. I don't know what it is, something or other. And we're here to do, and we're still alive, so we're here to do talk about death, okay? So we get ready for it. So we can be ready for the next life, can carry on with as little disruption as possible, so we can carry on at least and at least another human re rebirth, hopefully born to a Buddhist mummy first thing, so, so we don't have to wander around lost for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, so that we can carry on developing our, our Buddhahood without, with as little disruption as possible. That's the plan. That's the idea. That's, that's the attitude towards death in Buddhism, especially the Tibetan Buddhists, because it, coming from the Vajrayana, there's this detailed explanations of the process. And, from the, and we're using, as Lama Zabrim says, book as our basis. Uh, the latest version of the book is and the best one is published as a paperback with wisdom. Also, I think it's a digital book. It's called How to Face Death Without Fear. That'll be the basis. So we're here together to do that. This is the um, to listen to this so we can get a decent human rebirth, so we can carry on our spiritual path, so we can become a Buddha, so we can benefit sentient beings. And I'll sing our little Tibetan prayer that expresses this. Sangye Choran Sangye Tonam La, Janchu Badu Dagni Kyapsu Chi, Dagi Chani and Gipe Sonam Ki, Drola Penche, Sangye Drupa Shog, Sangye Choran Sangye Tonam La, Janchu Badu Dagni Kyapsu Chi, Dagi Chani and Gipe Sonam Ki, Drola Penche, Sangye Drupa Shog. So, what we're saying is, until we're enlightened, we're going to rely upon the Buddha, the Dharma, and his spiritual community. And um, we're going to listen to these teachings with the wish to become a Buddha. So we then will be able to be of benefit to others. That's the long, long, long-term goal. And as His Holiness Dalai Lama says, always, bet, always aspire to do what's most beneficial. And if we can, long-term, better than short-term. So that's what our motivation is, long-term motive. But the short-term we have to look at as well. So is there anybody here I don't know, Anna? Anybody knows? I mean, you've introduced me, have you, darling? Just in case Hello, everybody here is new, I haven't met anybody before. Or um, I think we're all friends already. Do you think so? Do I think, think so. Maybe we've got somebody here with a number for a name, 750975. So welcome. Okay. Um, not too sure who this is, but I think we've all met before. Helen, Good. maybe. Haven't met you before. I'm seeing with John, there's Manuel, there's Robbie, Eva. Okay, good. Well, I'm happy. Anyway, happy to be all here. We're all friends. Happy to see you all. Venerable, happy to see you there. Venerable, There's I'm Christy. happy. Hello, I'm Christy. Happy to introduce you, Venerable. Who am I? I beg your pardon? I'm happy to introduce you, Venerable. It's Dundrup. Oh, no, I only if people don't know. It's just in case I want to say hello to people I don't know. It's okay. You don't need to. Here I am. I'm Rabina. I'm Australian. I'm an American as well. I'm an American as well. When I went to my passport in 2006, and I said, can I keep my other passports? Because I've got a British and Australian. And she said, we don't mind how many passports you have, as long as you have allegiance for the United States. So I'm supposed to feel like an American. I don't know how to do that yet. I haven't learned, okay? Perhaps you can teach me. Okay, that's all right. Don't, no need. Don't worry about it. So, okay, okay, okay. There's so many approaches to this death business, you know. And, of course, here there's the, 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 the framework here. As I said before, at the very beginning, this is the, this is the point of it for the, for the Tibetan Buddhist approach, especially. I mean, Buddhist teachings in general, of course, we know Buddha asserts that con there are trillions of consciousnesses, sentient beings, mind possessors, whose minds are not made from, come from a creator, whose minds do not come from, from mummies and daddies. Bodies come from mummies and daddies, no problem. But the consciousness is the fundamental point that really is unique to the Buddha, probably. Well, the Hindus are a bit similar. Buddha came from the Hindus. Uh, is that consciousness goes back and back and continues on and on. The key thing that you could argue that both if you're a, you're a materialist, ph philosophical materialist, or let's say a Christian philosopher, philosophical Christian, the one thing you share is that you began in your mother's womb. And this is a major point, isn't it, that underpins so much of Buddhist practice. This view of the Buddhas, this observation of the Buddhas, that no, it's not like that. He would suggest that's a mistake. He's not being rude. He would say he's observed that consciousness has come from before. Of course, this is all based on the Buddhist techniques, which came from these genius Indians that enable us to access these subtler levels of our mind, which can indeed cognize subtler phenomena. It's all there in the Buddhist teachings. It depends on where you study. You might, it might, might, might not be too explicit. You know, if you study in the Zen tradition, for example, the emphasis isn't so much on this one. If you study in the Thai, it could be something else. But it's all there in the literature. It's all there in the body of knowledge coming from the Buddhist tradition going way back, you know. 
and it happens to be in the Tibetan tradition, particularly the Vajrayana, that this is um, has a place and made this concept um, is crucial to understand in order to understand the death process itself, and in order to understand the approach to death. You know, this idea that our consciousness continues, that's come from before and will continue after this death. And the second thing that's crucial to take as our basis here for understanding death is this idea of karma, the law of karma, which is a fundamental teaching of the Buddha. Again, it came from these ingenious Indians before him. He, he, he agreed, he saw the same thing, that every consciousness, every mind, every person, every mind possessor, whatever they think and do and say, is the process of producing that person moment by moment and producing one's future. I mean, as a concept, that's why the Buddha used seeds and fruits as an analogy. It's not a difficult idea. You see, put so so you put seeds in the ground, and then you nourish those seeds, and they ripen in the future according to your plan. You know, if you want if you want to be a gardener. Well, the same here. This is very much the point. Okay, so there's two approaches to being ready, getting ready for death. The first is coming straight from the Lamrim, from the from the. From, this is the classic teaching of the Buddha based upon this idea that everything's impermanent. So on the face of it, it's pretty evident to anybody with half a brain that things change, you know? But the Buddha is telling us that one of the misconceptions deep in the bones of our being is we grasp desperately at things as being permanent, meaning unchanging. Permanent here for the Buddha is the way they use the term, doesn't mean beginningless and endless. It means unchanging, kind of set in stone. It's, it's, a, it's a good stepping stone to understanding the deeper teaching about emptiness, about dependent or rising. But it's fairly, this one is fairly clear. And we can see from our own experience, look at, look at our experience, when really good things are happening, we can't stand the thought of their changing. And that's why we get so depressed when they do change. And when somehow we think it's a mistake, you know. And of course, when bad things are happening, this is a tragedy, we, we don't believe they will change. You know, this is what's fascinating. When things are good, good things are happening, when attachment is getting what it wants, we're all perky and excited. And we know we can't bear the thought. Even a meal, I know, even, you know, because you're attached to food, I'm attached to food. And I, you know, I, I, I drink my delicious this morning. I have either coffee or chai, right? I make my own chai. I use this ripple half and half. I use cardamom and ginger. And I make up all this nice combination, four black tea bags. I've got two big fat cups of tea. So when you first, we all know, when you taste your first mouthful, we know it's very delicious. And you don't want it, you, you want the next one to be just as delicious. But even as you have your third mouthful, and then even I'm anticipating, because I have to put it in my thermos, and I'm anticipating my second cup. Already, if you really pay attention, you, know, you see that it's kind of going down in pleasure. So it's changing, and it's kind of sad, because you know that next mouthful, the next cup of tea is just, you want it to be as delicious, but you know it's not. It's fading. So that's change. That's called change, and it's the nature. Of course, in Buddhist teachings, this is described the nature of the universe and elements and the four elements and blah, blah, blah. It's all studied in great detail, but it's a scientific fact we know for ourselves. And to be a Buddhist, know this. Buddha didn't invent impermanence. He just observed it. And what he's pointing out is this is the nature of how things are, which is scientific. But the problem is we don't want it to change when it's good things and we can't believe it will change when it's bad things. So we suffer terribly as a result of not being in touch with this reality. So this is the one here. So then we, as we know, in the, the lab, this presentation of the Buddhist teachings that's specific to Tibet, it's all coming from the same body of knowledge, whether you're studying in Japan, in Thailand, in, you know, wherever it is, doesn't matter. It's all the same. But that all the, the different traditions present things differently, isn't it? So this particular approach, the Tibetan Zatisha came along in the 11th century and Buddhism had been flourishing there for three or 400 years. It was very, you know, thoroughly in, you know, entrenched in Tibet. But uh, he wrote this, not about it, but he wrote this, he wrote this little text called Light That Guides You on Your Way. And he took from the S, he took the essential points from this vast body of knowledge studied in India, you know, up until then. And he presented all of the, the essential points of the teachings in, in a very particular way. His agenda was, it was orderly, an orderly way in terms of the capacity of the disciple, but his agenda was to give us wake up calls, you know. So the very first teaching is that things are impermanent. And he wants us to think about and to meditate on and to experience the truth of, not just impermanence in general, but death specifically. So of course, in our modern world, that sounds very depressing. To think about death sounds very depressing. You know, there's a book 
that I read while I was editing Lama Zoba's book, I always mention this, and it's called The Undead. It was this American journalist, and I'll mention a couple of things from his book. He's an American medical journalist, and his main expertise is death. And he, always, he joked in the book that people always think he's depressed because he must be he must be depressed because he's talking about death. He's not depressed. He's a funny fellow. He's hilarious, you know, but his job is to deal with death. But he's not at all depressed. It was very interesting because we think if you talk about death because we're too scared of it, you know. But what our teacher wants is to get us right between the eyeballs, and he wants us to counteract this very deep instinct of grasping at things as permanent in order to face the simple fact that we're going to die, you know. He, he speaks it very bluntly. So why does he want it? What's his agenda? This is the point. Why does he put this at the very beginning as one of the first contemplations? Not to make us suppressed, but to counteract the deep instinct of grasping at things as as not changing. So he could have talked about the impermanence of houses, relationships, but that's not, you know, he gets his between the eyeballs and he gets at the impermanence of me. That's the wake up call. And why? His long term agenda, why he wants to give us a wake up call as he presents each of these points in the Lamb Rim is to get us to realize, is to get us to not want to waste this precious life. The very first point is don't waste this precious human life. The next one is, well, you don't want to waste it, but guess what, honey? It's going to end at any moment. So you better in, he wants us to increase our sense of urgency to not waste this life. So the death one comes right there at the beginning. So then how does he talk? There's three points he wants us to contemplate. The first one is that the simple fact that death is definite. Well, I mean, it sounds fairly evident, doesn't it? We sort of think, well, come on, Buddha, give us something more exciting, please. We already know that. But Buddha's suggesting, no, I'm sorry, we don't know it. Intellectually, yes. Nobody in their right mind would be, would, everybody would be embarrassed to say, no, I'm not going to die. We all know from experience, as long as time exists, that people die, ants die, dogs die, humans die. It's just the way it is. Things in, disintegrate and disappear. It's the nature of things. And this is the crucial point again about the Buddha. He didn't invent this. He observed it. And what he's pointing out is that this deep instinctive grasping in our mind, as Lama Zobra calls it, grasping at permanent me. So then you should ask the question, why do we have this grasping? Why do we live in denial of this inevitable act of the event, you know? Because of attachment. I mean, we all know Buddha's main teaching is that we all suffer terribly because of attachment, this primordial instinctive assumption or primordial instinctive hunger for only the nice things. We don't, we don't, and that means when a nice thing occurs, this is what I'm saying, we can see this, it's very clear, that cup of tea, you don't want it to change into something unnice, which is one of the ways that things change. The way that things change isn't only that it turns in from nice to unnice. That's one way things change. But, I mean, in general, things are impermanent insofar as they just change from moment to moment. It's not good or bad. It's just how it is. But because we are so attached to nice things, and we assume the cup of tea is the cause of that pleasant feeling inside me, then you want to keep giving you nice feelings. So the more you drink the tea, you're convinced, we're convinced that I'll get more and more pleasant feelings. But our own experience, if we dare to look at it, will tell us it's just not true. But we don't like to think about it. It's too unbearable. Like always that example I use, you know, and as, I mean, I always quote Nicole Kidman, that actor. I, mean, I, don't want, I like her. It's rude, rude to use an example of her. I remember this interview, I always quote this, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, whenever she was with Tom Cruise, you know. And in the interview, she said, it's so, it's so clear, she said at the end, she said, we will be together until we're 80. This is the most, fa I mean, we could spend an hour talking about this. It's just so utterly fascinating. That's exactly how we are when you've got a really delicious thing happening. So, in other words, why is, does she say that? We will be together until 80. What, what is behind that? Because that's how we all think. When good things happen, when attachment gets what it wants, which is the delicious things and happy feelings, we're so absolutely will do everything in our power to keep them, to keep it. We want to sustain it, which is reasonable. We all want happiness. There's no doubt. There's nothing wrong with wanting the happiness to stay. But the trouble is, what it says, we're not, what, what we haven't realized is that um, because we're in samsara, things won't change. Things, one of the ways that things change is from happiness to suffering. One of the ways things change is they disintegrate. That thing that you're so convinced, which is this relationship, the thing that we're so convinced is the cause of the happy feelings because we want the happy feelings, then we, are, we, we then project on top of that event called the marriage 
because it feels delicious now, and because we're desperate for that deliciousness to stay, we then think it will last until we're 80. And that was interesting. The next sentence she said, I'll never forget this. And then she said, and of course, if we won't be together till we're 80, I will be devastated, which is exactly pointing the, making the point. It's fascinating, you know. It's such a brilliant example. And indeed, when he left her for Penelope Cruz, I joke, whatever happened, she was devastated. I remember reading another article about her in fetal position, in just totally despair. Until mother told her, until mother told her to get up and carry on with her life, you know. But this is exactly the example of the suffering that is caused by believing when a delicious thing happens, it will last forever. So when we're young, we can all see that. There's this feeling of there's this is hubris, isn't there? It's astonishing how deep it is. When you're young, when you're very young, I mean you can't even don't even understand change. I mean, one day takes about four eons to go when you're a little girl, isn't it? Then when you get start to grow bigger and you're young and fresh and delicious looking, I mean, it's fascinating. There's a hubris about youth. It's very fascinating. And one remembers it because you feel it's permanent. In other words, when, you, when you're young, I remember this, you see people who are old with wrinkles and bent. And it's, it's, it's as if they're a separate race. Think about this. It's like a group called old people. Think about this. There's a group called old people, as if it's a separate race and you're born like that. That's the, that's the way we see things as permanent. You, you put that label onto that group and then you see it as intrinsic in that group. It's fascinating. So when we're young, it's like that. It's fascinating. When you look back, we all know we were young. When you're fresh and young and you, you know, your face had no wrinkles and your little chest, like girl's chest, everything stood up nicely. Excuse me, being blunt. You all know what I'm talking about. And so we, there's an assumption there because it's delicious in general, even though we go up and down like yo-yos and get depressed, but there's this, this idea of, you know, being fresh and young and new. There's an instinctive belief, this is who I am and it'll last forever. When you get good things, when attachment gets what it wants, we will be together until we're 80. I mean, it's absolutely fascinating. That's exactly how our delusions work, you know. <coughs> in other words, <coughs> because we're all happy and delicious, you want it to last forever so much that you say it will last forever. Then look what happens, exactly the point, when it changed and it didn't last until the 18. Then what happened? And then you fall into despair. And this is the point now. Now you totally believe that the despair won't change. This is the tragedy of grasping things as permanent. This is not even the deepest suffering of grasping at things as intrinsic. So, of course, we think that was death. Death is a horrible word for us. But as Lama Zopi says in his book, you know, there's nothing wrong with death. We make it fearful because we can't stand the thought of it. And that's the, that's the deepest delusion that's there because we identify with this package called me. So we assume against all rational logic, that it's permanent, that I'm permanent, grasping at permanent me. So, the, you know, so because all these delusions are primordially deep, the Buddha would say from we've been believing in these stories for countless lifetimes, they're deeply instinctive within us, beyond intellectual. They're just completely spontaneous. They're instinctive. And instinct for the Buddha is simply the habit of having thought and done something for so long that is just there automatically. That's what it means. So this is pretty clear. So the way to counteract the first level, the first level of practice is nothing esoteric. Given that grasping at things is permanent, given that grasping at me is permanent, this package, grasping at me is permanent, is, is so instinctive. And because it's rooted in being a conceptual story that we've practiced for a long time to the point that it's now instinctively believed in, then we've got to counteract it by arguing with it. It takes time. I mean, look at us, someone has been Buddhist for years and years and years thinking about impermanence every day. And I can tell you with certainty, I still believe I will not die today. With absolute certainty, I will tell you that. I believe with absolute certainty that I'm going to wake up tomorrow. We're all like this. And it almost sounds silly discussing it. But that's how grasping at me as permanent functions. Even though I know intellectually it's not true. I mean, you know... 
um, if we did our analysis, if we did our research, for example, today, of the number of people, even just in our town, forget the planet, human beings even, forget animals, who went to bed last night, who didn't wake up this morning. Just that exercise. I think if we did that research, we don't do that research. We don't like that research. We don't like surveys like that, you know. There would be so many. And that person, just like you, went to bed planning tomorrow, you know. We all know this. I mean, we kind of know it, but it's so horrible to talk about. It. And it seems so kind of like hysterical, so dramatic to talk like this, you know. We don't quite get the meaning of it. The only reason we have to think about this is to get us to get us to recognize the simple reality that I am impermanent. But then you think, then what? What that's not the real point. Then what? <clears throat> that's the point. Then what? This is the point. Then what? From the Buddhist perspective. The third point, there are three points that teacher gets to think about. The first one is the simple fact that death is definite. And, and I'll go through the three points and we'll get to the conclusion. But the why we want to realize we're dying. We are, you know, we're dying. We're dying. So the first one is think about observe the world out there and observe, you know. You read the news, someone died last night. You read, you see the ad die. You see the rats, you hear about the rats die, the humans die. The people in, you know, like the people in the war, you know, you read about a war. I remember one of the, the stories in the New York Times a few, you know, a while ago was this family, wife and mummy and kids walking across the road with their suitcases in Ukraine. And they got shot right there in the middle of the road with their suitcases, dead, right there, dead, you know. They didn't expect to die. They knew they, were, they, they believed they were permanent, like all of us. The ant that got, just suddenly died has got a feeling of permanence right there. So we can see it's true. Death is definite. You think of all the people who, who lived, who've been born, who die. They all died, you know, maybe a few people who are over 100 on the whole planet. I mean, these are the simple kind of evident, intellectually evident facts. We can see them, but they don't touch us. Because and one of the reasons I think is because it's not me who's dying. Lama Zopa says it's very fascinating. One of the deep, one of the craziest delusions we have is, and so clear, we divide the world into living people and dying people. Think about this. Again, old people's a category. Well, so is a dying person. When you hear about Auntie Jane who's got cancer, she's a she's in the category called dying people, isn't she? You don't like to talk about dying people. You don't like to talk to dying people because if you're a dying person, you're not a real person because you don't have a life. Think about this, what it means. It's so huge. She's dying. It's like suddenly you've left the category of the world called living people. And we're in that category called living people. And again, there's this hubris, like, phew, it's not me, you know. She over there's dying. They over there die. It's like that. So the way to make this a real experience is very simple. Every time you read about it, hear it, see it, you go, all you have to say is, that will be me. Again, we're going to get to the point of why you've got to think this, not just to get us depressed. There's a, there's a, there's a logic to it. We'll get to it. That's the third point. That's the third point. That'll be me. Soon as you say that, it becomes personal. Because the fear of death is so tremendous, or the denial of death is so tremendous, that we can afford to see it happening out there, but as long as it's not me. It's very powerful, isn't it? That's why we, Lama Zopi says we believe we're, we're in the category called living people. This is very powerful. It's really clear, isn't it? So as Lama Zopi says, it's really best to think I'm going to die today. And again, we're going to get to the reason for this. Otherwise, it just sounds depressing. So the first one is observing. conscious On your seat, yeah, you do your meditation. When you open your eyes, that's when you're going to see it. Read the news, watch the television, read your iPad, see the people, see the ants, see the dog, hear about a car crash, hear about, you know, every day someone's husband just dropped dead, wife dropped dead, kids dropped dead, babies die, you know, children die, healthy people die. Really, as death is really death, although it's always shocking to us, like it's a mistake, you know. It's very fascinating. All that view we have, it's a mistake, is based on the assumption that somehow things are permanent. That's why we think death is like this insult, you know. And it looms so large for us, doesn't it? It's so clear. But as soon as you say, that second, you bring it to your own self. That will be me. We'll, we'll read this through. There's this little kind of prayer by Pabonka Rinpoche. It's very intense, you know. The end of each, many of the verses is, this will happen to me. 
This will happen to me. This will happen to me. Okay, so that's the first point about these three points. The second point is, and this is, should be, this should scare the life out of us. Excuse me. Just a minute, please. Back in Santa Fe getting allergies like crazy. Where's my turn off? There we go. Okay, so the second one is the time of death is not definite. Wow, I tell you, this one is hilarious. We, even if we do face the fact we're going to die, that we are impermanent, we are getting old, we are disintegrating, and you look in the mirror and you can prove it. It's true. We're facing that fact. But still, still, yeah, yeah, I'm going to die, but it's like it's a long way off. It's sort of in the distance. You can't see it coming, you know. It's a bit like, so for me, a good analogy, a good way to think. You're on a journey. You're on a journey. So even I drive from here to Albuquerque, about an hour or something, isn't it? It's a very, very good example, very vivid example. So when you know that journey, <clears throat> you leave your home and you drive and you're one mile away, already got a sense of the things you've passed, already you're one mile away from home and you're one mile closer to Albuquerque. Then you get two miles and 10 and 20 and you get a, and this, this is the point, you get a strong feeling, don't you, <clears throat> of, of arriving very soon in Albuquerque. In other words, a journey is a very vivid experience when you know how long it takes you got a feeling of how long it's taking. You know you, you passed that side. Now you've passed this one. you got a feeling of moving away from Santa Fe and you soon will be in Albuquerque. It's a very vivid experience, which is why when you're a child, it's so hard, isn't it? You know, you just don't have a feeling of that. Everything just seems to last forever. Are we getting there soon? Are we getting there soon? Will we arrive soon? Because you don't have a feeling of the moving of time. But that's what we have when we know a journey. Well, that's how we should live our life, you know. It's fairly obvious that we'd be intellectual about it and clear, theoretical. Every day you wake up, you're one day further away from birth and you're one day closer to death. These are not emotional things. They're facts. They're scientific facts. The difference here is we don't know, where Al we don't know when Albuquerque will come. Think about that. Think about that. You have no idea when it'll come. Even my friends on death row who've got kind of rough idea of the date still believe they're permanent, you know, because it's a deeply instinctive gut feeling. It's very fascinating. So we've got to try and get this sense <clears throat> every time you wake up, <clears throat> get to the habit, you know. Or when you go to sleep, you think, you know, if I don't wake up in the morning, may I wake up in the pure land or whatever you think. And when you wake up in the morning, you should be absolutely delighted. My goodness, you know, I'm, the example I use is like your petrol tank. Your gas tank hasn't got the, the meter on the car, you know. You never know how much gas is in the tank. And you, and you, you wake up, you, you park outside home, you don't know how much petrol is there. And you get in the car in the morning and you turn on the engine and there's still petrol there. You go, amazing, I can't believe there's still petrol in the tank. But you don't know when it's going to end. I think the petrol tank one is a great example. You, It would scare the life out of you. You'd be so alert and you would not want to waste one, especially if gas is rare, you can't find gas everywhere. You wouldn't want to waste one single half a gallon, one drop of gas, would you? Because you want to use it. This is the point now, getting to the point. You want to use it for the best things. You don't want to waste that petrol tank. That's it with a life, you know, with our life, not to waste. So what's the petrol in the tank for the Buddha? The karmic view, the karmic idea, the view according to the law of karma why we're still alive is because there's an still the virtuous karma of non-killing, that kind of build-up of karmic energy, petrol or gas, in other words, that's still in our petrol tank. It's like that. The length of your life is determined by the, 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 the amount of non-killing virtuous karma in your gas tank. That's quite the literal view from the Buddha's point of view. So because we're not clairvoyant and don't know how much petrol is left in our tank, then already we're getting a sense of urgency not to waste this precious life, not to waste this hard work we've done in the past to get this human body in the first place. We don't want to waste it. Don't want to waste that petrol in the tank because it's running out, you know. There's a real sense of urgency, and it doesn't bring depression. It's the opposite. It brings enthusiasm because you've got something that's special. The third one is the point. 
the reason why we want to realize impermanence, you know? Because, I mean, given the view that our consciousness came from before, and given the view that our consciousness will go on and take another body when we die, and given that every millisecond of what I think and do and say is the process of quote unquote creating karma, putting gas, gas in the tank, given that the virtuous seeds, actions I do with my body and speech based on virtue and goodness and kindness and wisdom and all the rest and my spiritual practice, given that those karmic seeds will ripen as a happy rebirth, good tendencies, happy experiences, etc., because I create them all, not given to me. And given that the negative actions I do will leave seeds in my mind, and these are actions that are done with my body and speech that on the basis of delusions or the delusions themselves, they sow seeds in the mind that will ripen as my future suffering. And finally, given that I do want happiness, in other words, I want a garden in the future with flowers and veggies in it, and I don't want a garden with weeds in it, this is pretty logical, then it follows clearly that what's most important at the time of death, when the mind leaves the body, the only thing that's of any use to us at that time called death, the only thing that is used to us, not the body, not the husband, not the pension plan, not our beautiful children, not our grandparents, not our reputation, not our good health. I mean, you get my point. We all know this. None of those things can be brought with you. The only thing that will continue is your mind with the karmic seeds. So given those givens, then this is the point. Why do you want to get a sense of urgency about death? It implies not wasting this precious life. It doesn't mean you just think about death all the time. That's silly. That's ridiculous. When you've internalized it, it's implied that you're impermanent, so you won't waste your life. That's the consequence of, of internalizing impermanence, not that you're afraid of death and you think of it all the time. No, no, no. You now know it's true and you won't want to waste this precious life, so you will only want to continue to practice. That's the logic of the whole thing. So, of course, all this is taken on Buddha's views. This is Buddha's views. You don't have to believe Buddha's views. You don't have to really think about them, but this is the view we're discussing here, isn't it? This is the reason for the Buddhist view, why you want to think about death, to get the wake-up call. You don't want to waste your precious life. You want to create as much positive seeds as possible. And we're not discussing compassion here, people. This is not compassion yet for other people. It's like compassion for ourselves. This is the first level of practice. We've got to get the wake-up call for ourselves. The simple fact that I don't want future suffering. This is the whole point of all the first level of teachings for the Buddha. The whole point of all Buddha's teachings of the Four Noble Truths. He points out that there is suffering, there are causes, we can get rid of them, and how to do it. And who's, who's, who's he speaking to? You know, one of the common things that happens, people go to Buddhist teachings, and you're thinking, oh, I wish my mother could hear this, I wish my boyfriend could hear this, I wish my next door neighbor could hear this, they all need this. But excuse me, Buddha's talking to me. I've got to get the wake up call. I don't want future suffering. This is the basis of understanding karma. And this is the hardest one for us in the West, I think. Because it's still very hard for us to realize that we create ourselves. It's a very fascinating view. It's very hard for us because we feel the suffering comes from outside. So it's not fair, you know. And the happiness comes from outside. We think of it as all good luck and bad luck. But the Buddha is saying, we create everything that happens. We're the boss. So the more we have that view of karma, the more the concept of impermanence energizes us. Energizes us, you know. And it won't happen naturally. You've got to think it through argue with ego's misconceptions. It's the only way it'll happen. This will happen to me. So, so far, any questions? Time is it. Any questions so far, people? Happy to hear questions, please. On this point particularly, we're going to move on to all the other points very soon. Lorraine? Hello, yes. Lorraine. Yes, Thank dear. Um, I have a couple of questions. First of all, something that's been on my mind for a while and that's something I don't completely understand. Um, the incidences of things like Alzheimer's and dementia and how, because you're when you're talking about how we create ourselves and how we're yeah. constantly building ourselves, yeah. what happens to people when they start to lose that with disease? That's right. like that? I know, it's it's, it's very that? sad, isn't it? I yeah. mean, that's the trouble. You know, that's the thing is due to karma, 
This is also impermanence, isn't it? Like we get born and all the bits and pieces are in the right place. You've got a good mind, the brain is working, all the bits and pieces are there, the genes are nice, the physical, the mind has got good qualities, let's say. And then suddenly as you're getting older or whatever, the pieces stop working. This is an example of impermanence. The wheels stop working, the, the brakes stop working, the, you know, things break and not work so well. That's exactly what it is. So the, the so one of the results, so one of the, you know, one of the ways karma ripens, suffering, sickness, for example, that example of Alzheimer's or whatever, it's mental sickness. They're, they're losing these different parts of the mind called the ability to remember things that's called mem this is called mindfulness it's a part of the mind that when you get distracted you're able to bring your mind back to the thing you were thinking about and doing so when you when that disappears you are unable to do that so i know one of my sisters this is common her husband he has total no short-term memory second by second now he remembers names he remembers his wife he sees people he looks like normal but second by second he cannot there's no mindfulness left. It's finished. He can't bring himself back to the thing he was doing the second before. Our ability to have some continuity in what we're doing moment by moment is the, is, is the function of that part of the mind. So that part has stopped for people like that. Or people who go completely crazy or lose all the plot and have no memory of anything and get distracted and distressed. It's one of the, the results of negative karma, which is called ill health. So what can they do? Very little. My sister's husband needs total care day and night, you know. And there's nothing much he can do with his mind. This is unfortunate. So if he's, a, if he's spent a life being virtuous and he's been taken care of, so the fears are less, then at least he can, you know, he can be a bit useful. But nothing, nothing much you can do. The person can do themselves very little. That's where the same with animals and babies. They can do not much. But one of the ways that Lama Zobar talks a lot in his book, how we can help others. First, you have to take, take care of people. But also one of the major ways to help people like that is you help them. You, they, they hear mantras. They hear the subtler powerful energy of the buddhas and prayers and mantras which blesses their mind so the way we need to help people like that are you with me lorraine yes thank you that helps Good a lot um, i have another um kind yes. of um, segueing into that with um the way society views impermanence is like i i, I had this deep sense well it's something i've studied because i studied anthropology we have a culture of consumerism and consumerism is built on this idea that we need to preserve and we preserve ourselves yes. by consuming yes. and to that effect there's this almost demonization of forgetfulness and and um seeing anything as being temporary because that would mean that we can't buy anything to preserve it that's so right it's it's something that's uh, but then you want to be part of your culture because you're in it and you feel That's like right. you can relate to be people and be inside of your society. Uh -huh. But it feels, so you feel like a separateness when you can't relate on that anymore. Cause I'm. I understand. So I think that's the point about as we as we understand more and more impermanence and understand attachment and understand what under, what what drives all these impulses of our culture. Because Lorraine, what else is culture except a group of people all buying into the same viewpoints and we all support each other? So as long as we once we understand the fragility of that of that view, we don't walk around looking all depressed and sad and feel feel separate from other people. We don't just. We know, we know things are going to change. We might go and buy a new cup because your cup broke, but you're not attached to it and you know that could break as well. So you can still live in the culture without buying into the underpinning attachment and grasping at permanence. That's up to us in our practice, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Initially, you feel separate, but eventually we just join the universe and act normal, but we don't buy into it any longer. That's the, the key thing. Do you understand my point, Lorraine? Yes, thank you. That's helpful. Yeah, it's really important. Thank you. Anybody else there? Uh, and. Uh, no vulnerable, nothing in the chat. Okay. 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 Is there, is there, can I possibly say something? Um, Absolutely, Lorraine. Yes, please ask me. Yes. I wanted to thank you because you've been doing the blessing of the speech. Um, and uh, that's, I think that saved me this week. I was oh, in that's the good. ER. I'm very happy. <laughs> I was in the ER yesterday and yeah. I had gone to urgent care two weeks ago and told them, I think there's a problem with my kidneys. They took a sample and said, you're fine. You probably sprained your back and sent me home. I have been in so much pain. And finally I went back to the urgent care. And so that was yesterday, the day before we'd done the blessing of the speech. Uh -huh. This time they listened to me and I got somebody who was very observant and said, wait, there's a problem here. You need to go to the ER. 
and they did a CAT scan and found that, guess what? I've had kidney stones. How interesting. So, I mean, in other words, your people believed your words is what you're saying. Yes, not That's only good. That's a good me, example. That's but a perfect example, darling. That's what yeah, I'm they're not just listening. They're acting on my That's words. What... Now I'm getting these things, this feedback. Of but, that, but the more. first step was to believe your words, wasn't it? It's, yes, and it's very That's helpful. very good. That's well very done. Great. That's, an exact... That's a good example of the efficacy of the practice. Well done. I love that story. That's great. Thank you. Well done, girl. <laughs> so, okay, people. Um, okay, so that's the, the, the three points. Of course, it's, it's dealt with in great depth in the Lamb Room, as we know, and has lots of commentary on it. These are the three essential points that we should try and practice in daily life. So learn to be conscious, learn to be aware, learn to wake up, you know. Every time you see death, hear about it, you think that'll be me. Then you start to think, well, you know, just even though you know you're going to die, but it's sort of like a long way off. It's almost as if you're on that journey to Albuquerque and, you, and, and Albuquerque keeps moving forward. That's the way we think about death. You're getting to Albuquerque, but it's not going to come yet. No way is Albuquerque coming. And you keep feeling like it's, it's always going to be tomorrow. Never be today. Never be today. That's the way we think about life. We've got to start realizing every time we wake up, you know, one day closer to death. Not to depress you, just to wake you up, to realize the sense that it must, therefore, conclusion, I mustn't waste this precious opportunity. I mustn't waste one drop of petrol in my tank, which is my virtue. That's the thing that's given me this long life. That's the attitude. And slowly, like anything, you reprogram your, 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 your mind. You get new assumptions. You develop these new viewpoints. And they, even though these are so evident, they really do take time. You know? And all, as all the lamas would say, when you realize the truth of impermanence, I mean, this is the most profound realization, well before bodhicitta, well before compassion, well before emptiness already your life will be profoundly changed because you will have a sense of urgency and focus and won't want to waste your life. And that gives enthusiasm. That's the point of it. This is this first, very first meditation, entry level, junior school, grade one, you know. So it's very, it's profound, simple but profound. We must practice every day and just, and just take it for granted, you know. And then, of course, we apply it to everything. Not just me is impermanent, but everything's impermanent. You know, your, your possessions, your relationships, your events, your job, your pos everything's impermanent, changing moment by moment. And, and the thing, eventually, as we start to realize this, you don't get depressed because things change. Initially, you do because you believe they weren't changing before. Now you get to know that they're going to change. So then you learn to, you know, you learn to ride the waves of impermanence. Things change and you just get used to it instead of freaking out and resisting it. With fear, which is how we are, you know. In other words, Buddha's telling us that much of us, that our suffering is not because things change. Our suffering is because we wish they didn't and think they shouldn't. It's our resistance to it, our aversion to it. That's the cause of suffering, you know. That's that view in the lamb room, a starting point in the, in the lamb room, starting point. It should underpin all of our practice from there on. And you build up then your realizations of the next points, you know. This is a huge one. So now let's, so Rumeshe talks about this, of course, in his book. But then he gets to the, to because the, the, frame, the framework of this book is how to help others, you know. How to, I mean, the, they're all lovers of his teachings. And when he gives the teachings, he's talking to the group of people in front of him. But if you're writing a book, you've got to think, well, who are you talking to? So you can't, this book is obviously, so it's framed in such a way that it's talking to us as a person who's alive, how to help your loved ones, help your pussycat, help your dog, help your grandma, help other people die. And of course, by implication, it's helping you die. But the advice is given as a way of to help others. And that's the major point about the book. And it all started, this book all started, it was in 2003, in France, at our centre, the Institute Radio Guinea, Lama Zopa Rinpoche was giving teachings about some other topic completely. And one of his students, a good friend of mine, came to Rinpoche and said that her old father died and she didn't know what to do, she told Rinpoche. And I think he was quite shocked because she's a Buddhist for many years and we all know about impermanence. One of the first teachings you're going to learn from the Buddha. And it was surprising because, and this is a typical example, because even though she's a devoted Buddhist, we don't like thinking about death. We just get confused, you know. So he, he changed tack immediately and the teaching then became about how to re get ready for death. And that was the basis of the teachings in this book. There's other teachings from other events as well, of course, but to put them together, you know, but that was the basis. So Rinpoche says, 
that if you want to help anybody in this life, if you have to choose, when they need you most is at the time of death. So, of course, in the materialist world, that's a complete shock. In fact, we can see it's the opposite. We almost now, in the world, in hospitals, we hasten death now. We drug people out of their brains and we're hastening death. Laws are changing where we can tell, get people to die. We can kill people, basically. So it's the opposite view. Because why? And obviously, the, the assumption in the modern world, the, the materialist philosophical view, is the assumption of this body is the person. And when the body is gone, the person has gone. It's obviously based on that. It's not the Christian teaching. They say the soul will continue. It's not the Buddhist teaching. It says your mind will continue. But the materialist view goes without saying. So, of course, that's the view that prevails in our culture. That's the view that prevails in our sciences. So that's the view, that's the view that determines things. So we are indeed hastening death now. So that's the part. This is the point that we're making. So it's really important to understand that point. Why? Oh, what happened to my light? Why? Why? This is such a point to understand. Why? Is that the best time to help somebody? I mean, help them all their life, of course. Because, this is the point, you, you, you get born into this life, you wake up in this life, at the, from the first second of conception, in your mummy's womb, the fallopian tube or wherever, already programmed with all the karmic seeds that, one, caused you in the first place to go to that particular womb, Two, that cause that will pro provide you with your mental tendencies. Three, that will provide you with your experiences in, at the hands of others in that life that you've just begun. And fourth, even the physical way the environment works upon you. All the millions of karmic seeds from your own past actions have now, which were triggered at the time you died. This is the whole point now. Let's look at this. I'll go into that in a minute. But given that that's what the story is from the Buddhist perspective, that you come into this life fully programmed with the, your entire personality, your tendencies, your experiences, the, the way the environment is, whether you're going to be rich or poor or fat or ugly or beautiful or whatever, all of that's already programmed in your mind from that second. So then you live those seeds out in this life. And then eventually you leave this body. But what happens next is you're going to take another body. And because, as we discussed before, the Buddhist approach is, you are, you, I mean, if we take the view, if we just forget the Buddhist view, okay, take this as a hypothesis. If we, okay, forget another life, forget another life, just think of the future. We all know there's a thing called future. And of course, we assume it's, we, we mean by future of this person here in this body tomorrow and the next day, and next month and next year and five years time and 10 years time. That's called the future. Now, we know, we know, let's say our body, if our body is going to be here in five or ten years, we understand logically that I need to, prepare, I need to cause as well as I can that future body. And we know the method is to eat well and don't eat bad food and do your best to get healthy. We know that. If you want a garden in 10 years, if you want a building in 10 years, it's called the future. And we know that to provide the future, you need to fix the, you need to do the job in the present. If you want money in your bank in five years in the future, you've got to put this, you start the ball rolling now. It's sort of logical. We get this so easily and totally when it comes to this life, the future in this life. Well, that view is exactly the same when it comes to another life, the future after this one. The principle is the same. That's what drives the Buddha's teachings. So then because the view of karma is the Buddha's view, not that we're not, we're not leaving it to a creator to make sure we get a nice rebirth. You don't just cr cr cross your fingers and say, may I have a lovely garden in 10 years and hope it'll come. No, you've got to sow the seeds. You don't just hope you'll have nice money in the future. You don't just hope you'll be healthy in the future. You create the causes. That's the Buddha's view. So it's not a complicated concept. Just we're not used to thinking of rebirth, that's all. It's sort of mysterious to us. You know? So we have to prepare for the future. So obviously that person is now, that this life in this life is the future of our past, isn't it? So we're living out the seeds that we've planted in the past. This life is the fruit of the past seeds. And we live them out. But every second that we're experiencing the fruits 
of our past seeds, we're also create, sowing new seeds that will produce our next future. So at the time of death, this life is now over. The only thing that is left is, is to help the person nourish the seeds they've already planted or help, them, or help them sow new fresh seeds that will ensure that when they do die, they will get a decent future rebirth. It's really practical, you know. You take the view of karma and you take this view of reincarnation and that's what's implied in the Buddha's teachings. That's what's behind this entirety of every word of advice in Lama Zopa's book. To help a person, a dog, a mouse, an ant, your grandma, and of course yourself, die well so that one of the billions of karmic seeds in your bank vault, that's appropriate one, will be a non-killing karmic seed, will be triggered even before you stop breathing. This is, this is the process of death. Now, this is how it works. Let's go into this. And then we'll discuss how to help people. And we'll discuss the scenarios that Rimension talks about and, and the advice of how to help people. And then practices to do to help people in the weeks and months before they die, the days before, the hours before, at the time of death, the hours after, the days after, and the weeks after. It's a chronological process, you know. So what happens is this. This is according to the Vajrayana system based on the observation of all the holy beings, all based upon what it's teaching. So, okay. So, there's two different scenarios. One is from the Sutra teachings, which is the 12 links of dependent arising. And the other one is from the Vajrayana teachings, which, which describes the death process in terms of eight stages of this gradual deconstruction of the, the components of the person. Okay, so these two play out together. They're separate, separate teachings, but they occur at different times interactively. You know, so we'll go. We'll touch upon these different stages as we go. So the point is, death. The time of the death process itself. We're all dying slowly. We can see that we're gradually moving towards death. But the conscious, the 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 actual proactive process. Of, of stopping breathing and leaving the body and going to the next life. This, the, the process starts identifiably, you know, usually a couple of hours before the breath stops. What time is it? Yeah. How are we going? 11, okay. What time's that? What time, what's, the, what's the break time, Anna? Um, 12 till half one. Okay, another hour. We have another hour. Good, okay. Okay, so now let's go through this. Okay, so now, so now there you are. Your mummy's there. Your mummy, let's say your mummy's a Catholic. My mummy was a Catholic. I wasn't with her when she died. My sister was with her when she died. Anyway, let's say it's my mother. And, she's, and she died sort of fairly quickly, but let's just assume it's a person dying slowly. The advice of this book, of course, mainly is for people, you know, the weeks and months before, a person who's kind of sick and old and moving towards death. So, um, uh, the first thing is when you start to die, usually a couple of hours before the breath stops, what happens is this. So the person, you know, we, we've got billions of karmic seeds in our bank vault. That's just my analogy, bank vault. Everything we think and do and say drops seeds into our bank vault. And there are different kinds of seeds. The main one, the main seeds that are the ones that give you a type of rebirth, they're called complete. They come from a complete action a complete karma. They're called the throwing karmas, the th that throw you into the next life. So we want, let's say my mummy, let's say I want my mummy when she dies to get a nice, another decent human rebirth so she can carry on on her spiritual path, whatever. So then the way I'm going to help my mother is to help her to be virtuous and relaxed and peaceful at this period. That's how you help people. And why is because Fear is very, very primordial, very deep for most people when they die. And I'm going to explain why. This is in the 12 links. It's a, it's a, as the breath death process starts and before you even stop breathing, which is the fourth of the eight stages, already intense grasping in, kicks in very strong attachment, but kicks in extra powerfully before you stop breathing, before you die. That brings a lot of fear. This is absolutely 
natural for every living being. It's a natural process that occurs. So given that intense, this intense grasping occurs, about the third of the eight stages, then your job, whether it's your aunt, the bird, your mother, your job is to help help them navigate this experience to kind of like metaphorically hold their hand because, and that alleviates their fear. So even though that grasping is still intense, if you help them with other ways, like if my mother was a Catholic, for example, you know, saying prayers for my mother, letting her hear prayers, talk about God, talk about heaven, all these different practices. Lama Zobar's a whole series of chapters of what to do to help your loved one, you know, at different stages, what to think about, what to talk about, what to hear, what to say, what to see, all these many kinds of practices that can help your dog or your mother at this period be, you can help them navigate this process. This is the help that you need to give somebody. Because the experience of most people is that most people, you know, don't look at their minds, are not prepared for death, don't think about death, live in denial of death, are not practitioners of any kind, aren't conscious, just we live our lives mindlessly. And then because we've died like a million times before, but we've, we've not remembered, the instinct of fear is so strong. And most people don't know how to die well, don't know what to do. And then most friends and family, my old friend went to Rimache, I didn't know what to do, you know. So we don't know how to help each other and we don't know ourselves how to die. I mean, of course, there's lots of examples of experiences for people who do die well. Absolutely, there's no doubt about that. They're amazing. Because there's so much fear there, so much instinctive fear, resistance to this idea, and you don't know what to do. There's nothing more fearful than that. You don't know how to navigate this experience, you know. So as Rumi says, this is education we all need. Does your pussycat needs you to help her? The mouse, the ant, there's ways to act and be, you know? So the process of death, it can, there's eight stages. And this is based on the Vajrayana model of the universe, which describes we've got gross consciousness, which is our sensory consciousness. And that's obviously inextricably linked to this gross body, this bag of bones, isn't it? You only have eye consciousness, which is that part of your mind that isn't physical, that exists in dependence upon a decent working eyeball and the eyelid open and the lights on and all the nerves working nicely. So there's the physical part and then there's the mind and they work together. Ear consciousness, tongue consciousness, tactile, smell and visual, the five senses. We know this. That's your grosser level. And so the first four stages of this de death process is the deconstruction of these components. And this begins probably a couple, I mean, it can be much longer for some people and much quicker. For people who die suddenly, it happens in an instant, you know. You go through the same process, but it happens very quickly. So the first, uh, there are these eight stages and various things. I think you've got the course notes there, and I think you go, it's in the book, it's in the course notes you've got. You know, each of these four stages, various components of the person cease functioning and these components of the person of course are based upon the the buddhist um, model of the physical and, and mental person you know so the very first one well i'll keep it simple just a few things the earth element ceases and your body now okay what's fascinating about this process of death it's exactly the same physiologically and psychologically to when you go to sleep the difference is when you go to sleep there's not much fear you know you're not fearful some of them might be, but it's not necessarily happening. So the first one is, you know yourself very well. I'm sitting there chatting to Anna, and my body feels really heavy because I'm so tired. We know this experience. Well, that's your earth element beginning to stop functioning. At the same time, your eye consciousness, you listen to this. I'm looking at Anna. I'm sitting upright. She's talking to me, but I, my eyes are kind of glazing over. It's really hard to see her. We know this experience because you're now your eye consciousness is ceasing to function. The, the, and this is all the first, the very first of the eight stages. Then the other one is the next one. They talk about this. Um, so you're, 
they also talk about the five aggregates. Now, this gets a bit abstract for us, but it's just a way Buddha described what we're made up of. And the first one here to go is form, which is the body, which is similar to the earth element ceasing. So the form aggregate ceases, the body, and then there's this particular kind of wisdom. Buddhas, they describe the five wisdoms. It's a bit abstract for us. But the first one is this one that ceases at this first stage, along with the eyes, along with the body, along with the form aggregate, is the capacity... What is it? Which one is it? I forget. I have to look. You got somebody got their notes there. You can look it up. John Drup, can you look at the notes there? What's the first of the what's the first of the wisdoms that goes at the first stage? Can you look it up on the thing? You got the course notes in the the eight the process. Or have you got it, Anna there? I can't remember. I suddenly can't remember which one, the wisdom. I'll I'll find it vulnerable, Rabina. Okay, well, I think John Drup's looking as well. Let's let John Drup do it. Can you see it in the course? No, it's chapter. The chapter there says the eight stages of death or the death process. I think it says that. I should have it myself, but I haven't got it here, I don't think. And I can't look into my iPad because I'm just talking to you guys. Well, I might have it here. It's good to be accurate. I don't want to be, lead you up the garden path. You got it there, Dundra? It's um, page 24, 25. It's the mirror-like wisdom. Which is the, the, and what does it say about how it functions? It says the mirror-like wisdom dissolves. These and the other four wisdoms are labeled according to the function of the senses. Oh, okay. So look at the list of the eight stages now. Maybe it's the next chapter. So are you looking for the dissolutions or? Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. that. Exactly. The first one. What's the mirror like? What's the function of what, what ceases when the mirror like wisdom stops? What is it? I forget what the way it works. So the. There's a vision of a mirage. And a yeah, before of, that, the very top when it says the aggregate. What does it say about the mirror? It's the aggregate wisdom? of the, the form, the aggregate of form. Yeah, that's right. Keep going. The next, the wisdom that goes, what is that? The wisdom, what happens then? What the is the consequence of the mirror like? Season. There is a there's a uh, vision of um, smoke. No, no, no. The first one. The first, I can't. I just can't find the book. I'm sorry. I forget about. It. I'm sorry. That in, in the very first of the eight stages, it says. I, it's, excuse me, Fernando Bean. I think it's the ability to see many objects at the same time. Thank you. That's the one. That's what I'm getting at. There you go. Thank you. That's what I'm asking. Thank you very much, all of you. It's the uh, the mirror like wisdom is the ability. There you go. To discriminate between this and that. A lot of things, all no, a lot of things appear at once. So if you're bright, wide, if we're all wide awake and wound up right now, when we open our eyes, you know, you're looking in your room, you're looking outside, a million things appear to you, don't they? And you can see them all very clearly. You mightn't label each one, but you do if you look. There's frame, picture, light, couch, gray, pink, honey over there, microwave, light. There's a million things appear to you, very crystal clear. But this mirror-like wisdom, as they call it, begins to fade. And suddenly things are very blurry. and You can't contain a lot of information. Thank you very much. That's exactly the point. So that, that ability just begins to cease. And there I am going to sleep, talking to Anna. Already that's happening, isn't it? I'm becoming cloudy and vague. My eyes start to feel I can't see things. My body becomes heavy. These are the first signs of the first of the eight stages. Thank you very much. That's the stages of death. Great. Then and the, there's this, each of these eight stages is labelled in terms of what they call a subtle vision that occurs, and of course we are not familiar with these. We not we don't recognise these at all. The great yogis in their meditation who do this meditation every day of consciously going through these eight stages, they recognise these. And at least if you do the meditation, that Lama's always recommend. Rinpoche recommends it. It's one of the practices in the back of the book. The book's got eighty-seven different practices. So is to go through this as a meditation so you become familiar with it so at least when you do die you might even be able to recognize what's going on which is of course being conscious which then there's no fear it's marvelous so the mirror like wisdom the ability to distinguish many things all at once ceases your eyes begin to fade and stop don't stop working so nicely your body becomes very heavy and there's this kind of subtle and the earth element ceases and then suddenly there's um and then there's this kind of vision of a mirage which is like interplay of earth and water it's quite subtle 
This happens every time you go to sleep. It's clear we're not conscious of it, is are we? The next one, this is kind of an organic process, step by step. The next one is the form, the feeling. This is the aggregate called feeling. And here the, the, the wisdom is the ability to just, so what's it say, the wisdom there, uh, Lou? What's the wisdom that goes? Uh, the wisdom of equanimity, which sees these three together as having oh, okay. the same so we nature. Have this, okay, so discrimination between, um, you know, a ha happy un the, the three feelings of happy, unhappy, and neutral. They kind of merge. Then the ear consciousness begins to cease. Look into this one. I'm sitting up still, upright, Anna's talking, and I just missed the last 20 seconds. I literally didn't hear what she said. This is because your ear consciousness is gradually ceasing. This ability to distinguish between the three feelings begins to cease. The feeling itself, you know, the distinguishing between pleasure, pain, and indifference ceases. And then there's this subtle, then the the the, the element is the is now is the is the is the um earth water, the water element. The liquid in your body begins to kind of dry up, the spit, the eye, uh, you know, the liquid. And so, you know, this is why when you wake up in the morning, because the, the water element has kind of dried out a bit during the night, you wake up and your eyes are all dry, your tongue is dry, because the liquids, the, the, the water element had sort of temporarily ceased, you know, not as dramatically as when you die, of course. Then the, the sign of death here, the, se the vision is a vision of like smoky, they say. And that's interplay of now water, air of uh, the smoke, um, earth, water, fire, and the next one, which is kind of um, fire. So it's like, I think I say, so it's like smoky, you know? So the third one, your, your um, the wisdom, what's the next wisdom, Lou? Uh, discriminating awareness. You cannot remember anyone's names, people around Okay, very you good, yeah. 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 Now you're really beginning to lose the plot. You got your beloved grandma on one side and your worst ugly boyfriend on the right, and you can't tell the difference. So you're gradually deconstructing. You're losing the plot, you know. So you that wisdom disappears. Your fire element, your heat begins to leave the body, and the heat leaves the body either from the feet up, everything comes to the heart chakra, or the crown down. And it's a bad sign if your feet stay toasty and your head stays cool. That's not good. That means you're going to, a negative karma will ripen, you're going to go to the lower realms. Not that you can do much about it. You can't put a thermos on you. I mean, you can't put a water bottle on your, on your uh, mummy's head. I'm just joking now. So anyway, the, then the fourth one, then the, 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 the wisdom then is you can't, like I said, you can't discriminate between friends, enemies, and strangers. You, your, your, uh, the element, the, uh, uh, the consciousness that ceases your, um, is the, I think it's the nose, isn't it? the breathing, the consciousness, the nose consciousness begins to cease. Nose consciousness, what's that? Is there such a thing? Nose, air, water, fire. I'm losing the plot. What is it? Tell me smell. what you say. Smell, that's one. Sorry, nose, that's right, smell. That goes. And then the sign here is the interplay of fire, the element has ceased, the fire element is ceasing, and then the next one, which is air. So it's like interplay of that is like sparks. Then fire, so by this point, this is the eight stages now, but by this point, the other system that, that's called the 12 links kicks in, okay? This kicks in now. And at this point, very powerful craving arises naturally. That's about the eighth link. And then the ninth link, and, then, and that's craving, which is a strong attachment, and is a primordially deep one, the, the deep attachment to not lose the body. We're so attached to the body. We even assume I am the body. So this primordial grasping is grasping at me, terrified of losing me, basically. And it's attachment to this body, primordially deep. This kicks in at this point. And this is then the next one. The, this, is, this is the 12 links little system. The, the next one of these is called grasping. And grasping is a really much more powerful level of attachment. And that is the, that's what triggers at this point, before you stop breathing, that's what triggers the karmic seed among your billions of karmic seeds in your bank vault, the particular karmic seed. So we think of our past life, okay? A few weeks before our mind found its way to our present mother's fallopian tube, our mind was in another body. It could have been a kangaroo or an ant or a human. 
But at that point of our death, we've gone through the process. At this point, before we even stop breathing, this intense grasping kicks in and that becomes the trigger that triggers the karmic seed, which in our case was a very virtuous karmic seed of non-killing, practiced most likely, as Lama Zopa says, in a, in, a, in a past spiritual practice. But not only even that, this rich, delicious karmic seed of non-killing that we, that we grew from our practice, not only of the spiritual practice, but of having living in vows of not killing, that seed was triggered at that point. The grasping is very fearful, but that means whatever the conditions were, our grasping triggered one of those karmic seeds that then programmed us already in a few weeks' time to go to our present mother's human womb. We were already programmed in advance. Your mother mightn't even have even have met your father yet, but you're already heading there. Karma takes care. So that's why in this time, especially before you stop breathing, is when you need a person to be holding you metaphorically, helping you stay calm, helping you stay virtuous. Because most people aren't ready for death, haven't understood death, haven't thought about it. Therefore, there's a lot of fear. And we all know it's so practical. When a person's got a lot of fear or anxiety, the best help you can be is be there like a rock of Gibraltar. Just be there. Because when you know when you're fearful or anxious or freaking out, we desperately want someone to turn to, don't we? It's so automatic. And that's what your role is. So it's education we all need. But just to be there for a person is like a miracle of a gift. And your dog is the same. Don't just have your dog killed by the vet. Let your dog hear mantras at that point. Your dog adores you. Your dog trusts you. If they see you, they feel safe. If your mummy sees you, she'll feel better. If you make her feel peaceful. Every sentient being is like this because death is a very painful time for most people. It's just primordial fear. So if you're there helping them feel better, I think even in an old people's home, you know, the, 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 the sweeping lady who comes in to sweep the floor, if she's kind and sweet and gives a loving word to that old dying person, that's like a miracle of a gift to give somebody. You need to make people feel safe and confident. And that's what your presence is. That's the most fundamental level of it, I'd say. We know this. As soon as a bad thing happens, we think of someone to turn to. And then if you have someone has no one to turn to and they don't have the tools themselves, that's the despair that most people experience, you know. So it's the most precious gift when people are sad and lonely and sick or dying just to be there for them, loving them, being kind to them, making them feel safe. It's huge, this point, I think. It's just huge. And this is the time. Because this karmic seed was triggered. So in our, this is the interesting point. In our case, a virtuous karmic seed was triggered from our own past practice, from our own past non-killing, having practiced in a spiritual path. And that could have been planted 47 lives ago. And that was triggered. The conditions all came together. Whatever, maybe we're a kangaroo and we, we, maybe a human being went past us and said a mantra in our ear. How do we know? You know, maybe a little doggy. And some conditions all ripened that enabled you that virtuous come and seed to be triggered in your mind. And now that's the point now, because now as your mind is getting more subtle, we'll go back to the eight stages in a minute, because your mind is getting more subtle, your body is disintegrating, but your, your subtler mind is now coming to the surface, which is much more sensitive. And that is more able to see things. So a person for whom a virtuous karmic seed is triggered at that point, their death will be extremely blissful, peaceful experience if for one person a negative karmic seed is triggered at that point then their death will be very very scary very very depressing very fearful because as their mind gets more subtle your, when your mind's more subtle it's like you literally have clairvoyance you can see the future life coming you can see it so if it's going to be a lower realm birth the, the, the death will be horrifying People who freak out and have visions and are seeing horrible things and hallu seemingly hallucinating because a negative karmic seed has been triggered that is showing, moving them towards a suffering rebirth, you know. So that's why this particular point precisely, it's like crossing a six-lane freeway, having someone hold your hand do it, if, unless you're qualified. So if the yogis, they're qualified, you leave them alone, you lock the door and leave them in peace. They know exactly what they're doing. Most of us don't. So this is the most precious time to help somebody.
According to, I mean, of course, if my mother's a Catholic, you don't want to, sh- you know, shove Buddhist things down her throat. So you'd say nice things to her about God and loving her and help her be peaceful and say prayers. Actually, when my mother died, it was rather funny. She met Lama Zopa and Lama Yeshi, you know, she was a Catholic. She met Lama Zopa and Lama Yeshi. And, um, and I'd become a Buddhist nun by this point, of course. I'd been a nun for about four years, three years when she died. And what was interesting, I was living in England, and my sister, there were seven of us in the family. My older sister, my, my mother had gone up to her house. Up in, doesn't matter, she left to another city and was with my sister. And she died there that night. And the, the first person my sister called was midnight. So the first person she called was me. And she said, Mummy just died. Mummy just died. What will I do? And I said, say, oh, money, pimping on Maria. And she said, oh, what? So she wrote it down and she shouted, oh, money, pimping on my mother's ear. My mother was a musician, so my, my sister had Brahms playing really loudly because my mother was a Brahms fan. I said, say so, Omani oh, Pemming So she said, Omani oh, Pemming in my mother's ear, you know. And then the next day, I, no, that day, that minute, I, no, by the morning, I rang Chen Raising Institute 100 miles away where Lama Yeshi had just arrived and he'd met my mum. So I asked him to do special prayers for my mum, you know. So I felt that she was very fortunate. She had Lama Zopa help us through the process. Anyway, that was how my mother died. So anyway, the death process, we're back to the stages now. The third stage occurs, we've just talked about. Now the fourth one, so by this point, the karmic seed is already triggered. And by this point, you can observe probably in the person's behavior, how they're gonna, what, what type of rebirth. Because one example, my friend, one friend in, in Vajrapani Institute in California, um, oh, this is uh, like in 19, the late seven, early 80s, late 70s. He was working, on the roof of the gompa and he fell off the roof his wife was there and he died in her arms and she said he was radiant when he died so we can assume from that that at that time a virtuous karmic seed was triggered and so that is new his future rebirth would have been a very blissful one and so as his mind got more subtle it's like they're seeing it people looking like people who see light and all those things you know looking like they're radiant looking because they can see their new rebirth coming because their mind's more subtle so in his case, for example, I remember when I always tell the story about how Steve Jobs died. I love this story. I read his one of the, me, the memoir of one of his daughters, his first daughter, not the children from his second marriage, but from his first marriage. And she taught in the book it was interesting. She when he was very sick, he had this liver cancer or something, and he was dying. And uh, she went there one day, and there was this Tibetan Buddhist uh, monk. He's actually uh, um, he's a Argentinian or Brazilian, as a friend of mine, I can't remember, but he's been recognized as a reincarnated Lama by his main Lama, so he's known as Rinpoche, and he's a healer, and he was there with Steve Jobs, you know, so I was very happy about that. So anyway, the day that Steve Jobs died, another daughter, another, no, his sister wrote about it, and you could tell from his way he talked, he knew he was dying, several years he's talking about impermanence and everything, so there he was on his bed, and the, the wife rang the sister and said, you better come quickly. You know, he's going to die soon. You know? So she came that day. He's lying on the bed. And his two daughters were there. And I'll never forget the story. It's very fascinating. She wrote about it. He was sitting there. Let's say, you know, I, I can't. A person's in front of me. I'm the, do- I'm, the, I'm the sister. And Steve is in front of me, right? And, I, and, and he's looking. And his two daughters are in front of him. And all I can see is their heads. And I can see Steve's face. And she said he was radiant. And he's sitting up and he's looking with incredible love at his daughters. And he says, please forgive me for having to leave you. In other words, I can deduce there was no attachment there. It wasn't grasping, freaking out. He was radiant, she said. And then suddenly he said, she said, me, the sister, looking at him, he looked over their shoulder into the distance. And then he went, oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. And then he died. So all I can deduce from that behavior is that, he died very quickly. He went through the four first stages really quick. But suddenly he's awake and wide, wide, awake, wide awake. And suddenly he's blissing out saying, oh, wow, looking in the distance. So clearly a virtuous karmic seed was triggered probably by that love arising in his mind. A very virtuous karmic seed, maybe go to a pure land, who knows? And he's seeing it coming and he's going blissing out and then he dies. I like, I love these stories. They're really nice, you know. At the same time, the suffering ones, a friend of mine in Australia, a nun up in Queensland who works with the dying, who sits with the dying. And one fellow said she'd never experienced anything like it. He suddenly at this time, as he started to die, became like a demon. His eyes became red. They were rolling in the back of his head. He was freaking out like he was seeing the worst vision in the universe. 
freaking out, like unbelievable. Then she said he calmed down and then he died. And she asked her llamas and they said what seems to have happened was a, 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 like a hell birth karmic seed was triggered or a very suffering rebirth was triggered, but, so, but it didn't finish. He didn't die all the way and then he calmed down. So he purified that karma and he died very peacefully. And Lama Zopa says in the book that he had a similar experience with a person about that. So there's many things can happen at that time. And this is the period you needed most to help them navigate this experience. This is the point. And then, of course, once they stop breathing, which is the first stage, the fourth stage is now the fifth of these, uh, the fourth, um, what's the, yeah, the, the, the mirror, what's it called? The, what's the wisdom called? The fourth one, Lou? Can't hear you. Unmute. All accomplishing our completion. Okay, this wisdom. wisdom is the ability to even know who you are. You've really lost the plot by now. You can't think any thoughts. You don't know who you are. You don't know anything. All of this is gone. Your your nose, your 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 air, your um air element ceases, and the tongue, the tactile consciousness ceases, and the tongue consciousness ceases. And there's a vision of like the light around a butter about a candle just before it goes out. And as one Lama said, I always quote this, my Lama Geshe Rabton, that tongue that spent its life, it, apparently the tongue gets very short and turns blue at the root. And Geshe Rabton says, and that tongue which has spent its life gossiping is now useless. I love that. So then you look like you're dead. So for the Western model, you're ready for the body bag. For this model, you're not dead yet. Okay. So I think we should, it's only 11.30, God. We need a break. Can we have a lunch break now? Is that okay? Better, I think. I mean, yes, I'm always just intense. Even when I speak nice things, I'm intense. So I make people more <laughs> tired. All right? So that's a good point. We're now stop breathing, okay? And we'll carry on after. We'll go the rest afterwards. So I think have an hour and a half break. That's okay, everybody.